Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another virtual big room here at CD 92.9. I'm Grayson Kelly, joined today by a very special guest, front woman of the legendary punk rock outfit Against Me, back this year with a surprise solo record called Stay Alive. Uh, honored to have Laura Jane Grace here with us today. Hello, Laura. How are you? I'm good. Honored to be here. Are we at your spot in Chicago? Is that where we're at right now? Yes, I'm at home in Chicago. Um, the city's under a, a stay-at-home advisory, right? So, uh, yes, at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of time spent at home in the past, what has it been, almost nine months? Uh, Years, could be months. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm definitely, like, I think I'm mentally checked out, like, around November 1st, and I've been having a hard time um, caring. <laughs> since, <laughs> since I'm just, like, I'm ready for the year to be to be over, you know? I'm ready for the, like, that period of time around Christmas where it's totally acceptable to just lay on the couch and do nothing. Um, that's where I'm at mentally. Yeah, I, um, I usually ask <laughs> if anybody's got any weird hobbies, like, on the sourdough bread thing. <laughs> Um, well, you know, uh, in all honesty, like I've played in a, a touring band since I was like 18 years old. And prior to that growing up, my mother ran a catering business. So I've always historically been a really terribly cook, terrible cook. You know, I'm like really good at eating in restaurants and I'm really good at eating food made for me. Um, but I have an 11 year old. So uh, in these quarantine times, lockdown times, uh, you know, I've had to learn to cook. So I've, I've, uh, I'm subscribing to like a meal service called Purple Carrot where they like send you all the ingredients and then you make it yourself. Um, so yes, I, I am like, I might as well be making sourdough bread. Uh, but I don't know, it's crazy. You know, like um, I've been off the road since March and um, it's the longest period of time I've had uh, not traveling in my entire adult life. Um, and it's been an adjustment. This past month in particular has been tough. I broke my foot at the beginning of November. I broke my foot, um, which is such a drag. It's like, you can't really go anywhere now anyways, but still, um, it was really, uh, it took the wind out of my sails to say the least. Yeah, how is that? How is your foot, by the way? I meant to ask much later in the interview. Oh, no worries. It, it's, you know, it is what it is. Uh, it's, it's, it's healing. Uh, I've, been, I've been doing like stretching and uh, cardio that doesn't endanger it uh, to keep the blood flow. And I got a, a thing called a bone stimulator. A fan from Twitter sent me a bone stimulator, which I didn't even know was a thing or existed. But a uh, bone stimulator, if you break a bone, you got to get one, right? So I've been using that as well. So healing quickly. Amazing. Yeah, I, I broke a toe like last year and it's it's frustrating because it's such a small thing, but it's so impactful. Yeah, and like I genuinely can't walk, you know, like I I, yeah. I sometimes I, I was like I was like getting heady about it and hard on myself where I was like, You're being lazy today. You haven't left your apartment, you need to take a walk or something. And then I tried to take a walk and I was like, No, I'm like not faking it. I just I just can't walk right now. Cool. Yeah. Well, I'm sure uh, you didn't come here to talk about your foot the entire time. We should jump in and talk about your work that you've released lately. Um, the new record, Stay Alive, which was released just a couple of months ago, and it's a fascinating, timely story behind the way that it was released. Um, many of these songs recorded over several years for your work with Against Me, and they found themselves in the open in a much more kind of raw, solo, acoustic kind of way. Can you tell us a bit about that? What made you say, you know what, let's just get these songs out there? Well, nothing about this record was really intentional. You know, it wasn't like I decided at the beginning of the year, like, I need to do a record this way. This is how it has to be. It was more just, um, you know, about working within means. And uh, like, I started off the year thinking I was doing an Against Me record. And, and, the, and we were working towards that. You know, we had spent like a week in the studio in January, again in February, and then again in March. And then we headed out on the tour. But we weren't like, we weren't close to being ready to record necessarily. We'd been working on us on songs, and I at that point had like already written like thirty some odd songs, but it still wasn't clicking. So when everything went down and we all had to go our separate directions um, because of the pandemic, like none of us live in the same cities, none of us live in the same states, and it became pretty clear as we were like canceling tour after tour after tour for the rest of the year that like all of our recording and, and studio plans were off too. And so like realizing that this was kind of an indefinite, open-ended, like no one really knows how long this is gonna happen, you know, and knowing how many songs I was already sitting on, like it seemed ridiculous to think that, okay, if this lasts like two years before we're really able to get back into the room, a room together, like are we really gonna wanna jump back into 30 plus songs that we had been working on two years prior, you know, like, no, that wouldn't sound exciting. We'll wanna start fresh when that time comes. But at the same time, like I didn't want to throw away the songs. So 
I really just like, I kind of took a, took a look at the songs that I had and realized like, there's, there's a record here, you know, like, especially if I just adjust my approach and like do it in a different way. And that means like working in Chicago and working without a band. So I like picked the songs that I thought worked best in that context and, and the songs that I felt like were really resonating with, with what was happening around me um, and booked, you know, four days at Electrical Audio. Here's stu a studio here in town that's like right down the street from me, that legendary studio owned by Steve Albini. Um, and I've always wanted to record there and always wanted to make a record with Steve. And it, you know, that was within my means to do. So I was like, all right, well then that, that's the way to do it, you know? And what a beautiful record it turned out to be. Um, talking about working with Steve Albini, uh, I like how one review put it, like Steve Albini, the perfect producer for these times because he just stays his distance, you know? Yeah. Um, how was it to work with him? Uh, I read that you, these are all analog recordings and they only took like a few takes max. Did you, is it true that you recorded this in four days? Yeah, yeah. Well, we recorded everything in two days, mixed it in the second two. But that was kind of like, you know, like the, 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 the making of the record was kind of split into two movies where like the first half was like a Rocky montage of like training. Because once I had booked the dates and knowing like, all right, this is going to be an analog recording. That's what I want. I want like the total opposite of a Zoom call. I want to make a document, you know, like and I don't want to lean on making edits. I just want to capture a performance to document like these songs, summer of the pandemic. Um, so once I realized I was committed to it, I was like, okay, well now I really gotta be ready. You know, like that's the deal when recording with Steve is like, just show up practice, show up ready to record. He will set up the microphones, he will make it sound good and he will press record. But everything else, like that's up to you, you know, like what, what it sounds like. So the first half was the Rocky training montage and then the actual making of the record, the recording was like this strange sci-fi movie where usually when you're in the studio, the outside world ceases to exist. But now just because of the fact that we're both wearing face masks, you know, like you weren't able to ignore what was able to, what was happening outside. But, but at the same time, it was so like post-apocalyptic feeling where it was like just the two of us alone in the studio, huge studio, wearing face masks, never saw his face, you know? And like, I'd go into the live room when it was time to record and he would just become a voice on the intercom uh, you know, to say like, okay, rolling, or how'd you feel about that one? And, you know, when it, when it's just two people, like you really do have to cut the fat like that, where it's like, if anyone's waiting, like it's the other person is waiting on you, you know, if you're holding it up. So like, you better be ready, better be ready to go. Yeah, you don't have an opportunity to kind of step back and say, okay, now it's somebody else's turn. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Which is usually, you know, the case with, the, with band recording. Yeah, uh, I, I like how you described it as two different films. I would pay to see those in a theater, absolutely. But uh, can we take a step back maybe to the prequel to those films? Because uh, I also read in Rolling Stone that before this process took place, before you booked the time, uh, you blocked everyone on your phone before the process started. Is that true, what I read? And, and what do your friends make of this? Like, oh, looks like Laura blocked me again. She's <laughs> probably just working on something cool. It is true. I did. I, I blocked everyone in my phone. I had like a panic attack. I had a total freak out at the beginning of the pandemic where, and a lot of it had to do with Zoom. I felt like so overwhelmed by the switch to all of a sudden, there was all this pressure to live stream to Zoom um, and just like all this drastic change happening that I didn't have a grasp on mentally. And so I was like, you know, um, this is like, a unique situation we're in right now. And I really feel like I just need to take a step back and get my bearings and adjust my approach free from influence of everybody, anybody. So I just, you know, blocked everyone in my phone and uh, took a little bit of time and got my uh, act together and uh, like quit smoking weed, like, you know, just really just like focused, had, had some real like Zen moments and then came out of the woods. Um, so you know, I, I hope that no one took it personally in that it was an across the board, just shut down of communication. It's not a targeted, like, I don't like you anymore. You know, it was just needed some space. Yeah. And that space resulted in something gorgeous. I like how you described it there as like coming out of the woods with it, because at the beginning of the pandemic, I know that that was something that a lot of us were kind of interested in, like a lot of musicians saying, OK, now that they have to stay at home, it's one of those disappear into the woods, come out with a record sort of thing. 
Um, but it turns out a lot of these tracks were before the pandemic even started. Uh, we don't need to walk through it track by track or anything, but how do you make about how prophetic a lot of the themes on the album wound up being? I, I guess like, um, I don't know, like, a lot of that speaks to the experience of Chicago. I find Chicago to be a really isolating place. So I was writing a lot of songs about feeling isolated, you know, and, and feeling kind of caught up, cut off and estranged. So naturally, once, you know, quarantine happened, that like became the prevalent themes and, and that just seemed to resonate more. Um, and then, you know, in particular, there's a song on the record called Hanging Tree that's like probably the most political song I've written in a second. Um, and the only song I have that in any way addresses Trump, you know, um, and, and that was something that like starting out with his administration, I was like, you know, like, how do you write a song about him? How do you address everything that's happening that I see around me right now? Um, and it took me a while to get there, but then, but then that song just seemed more and more relevant as this summer unfolded and it felt like it was the time to get it out, you know? Absolutely. And that's something that, um, always kind of fascinates me about the timeliness of certain songs. And I'm interested in your process. Uh, I find that the most important aspect of any musical work is its authenticity. But sometimes when writing about something so specific, there's a thin line between that authenticity and uh, sometimes lyrics becoming a little campy. And I'm not saying anything on this record is campy. I, I firmly believe the opposite, that it is a, a truly austere, authentic work. Um, but when you sit down to write, does that kind of cross your mind at all? How to get those thoughts out in a way that will stand the test of time? Well, I think that, that the trick to that is that it really has to come from subconscious flow. And it's when your subconscious flow starts aligning with your world around you that as an artist, for me, like I feel most fulfilled of like, ah, uh, you know, like what I'm working on is relevant right now without effort. You know, it's not like pandering or or trying for something you know um it just like kind of comes out of you and uh, i mean like you your job as an artist or a writer is to observe right and so if you're observing and then that starts to like almost predict then then that's fantastic you know um but uh the trick is to not do it on purpose <laughs> yeah i like how you put it in a different interview kind of the same thing working in your prefrontal cortex yeah, not your, the, the, you know, your lizard brain. You want to yeah. <laughs> lizard brain out of it, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, really inspiring to hear. I kind of want to take a guitar off the wall after this and uh, instead of getting back to work, just write an EP. Uh, but before we let you go, uh, I do want to touch in on the music videos that you've released off of this record, including one that just dropped last week for the Swimming Pool song. Uh, and I watched it with the scope of preparing for this interview in mind. So I was taking notes over the what two minutes <laughs> that I was watching it. And I think it's testament to great art because my notes go, oh wow, how creepy and unsettling. That's what I'll say, how scary this, this video is. And then by the end, you've got this, this horror movie skeleton kind of playing with the camera and dancing around a little bit. And I was strangely resettled in a way. And only later did I learn that I was simply just wrong about my first impressions. And that was the message that you were sending with the video. Um, <laughs> Can you expand uh, a little bit on the symbolism here going on? Sure, yeah. I mean, I guess it's like, you know, it's about how um, how things aren't always as you see, uh, as they seem, and kind of speaks to uh, the, uh, you know, staring into the abyss thing that we're all doing right now in, in these pandemic days, of that eventually uh, the abyss starts to stare back at you, um, <laughs> you know, and, and how like, I, I've read a bunch of books, books about dreams and they always say in dreams that like if you're being chased by something or um, if you're afraid of something as opposed to running away from it, you're supposed to run towards it and embrace it, you know, embrace the things that you're afraid of. So that's kind of been my, my overall approach even to the pandemic of like, especially with not being able to tour and everything of just like as opposed to being afraid of these things and like, you know, challenged by the mad way of just kind of like embrace it, just like work with what you've got. But a lot of the video too was like, um, you know, it, again, it's working within the constructs of like, how can you make a video safely in pandemic times? Well, one person has to be wearing a mask at least. <laughs> There's two people in the video. So it was like, all right, I've got some masks. Let's put on a mask, you know, and then no touching. Let's not touch. Like, uh, and then, you know, we'll have to be outside. So uh, <laughs> what can we do? 
Um, but I like that. I like the idea of like, okay, you've got these limitations. Like, so how do you work within these limitations? How can you be most creative in those ways? That's really fascinating. Cause I didn't even piece it together. The fact that it was filmed in that, in this era and that you'd have to take that into consideration. That's really cool. But talking a couple of moments ago, something I failed to mention uh, when we were talking about authenticity versus not that, but there's a separate line that falls uh, between a full band project and side projects and solo records and stuff. And sometimes it's a little tumultuous when those lines cross, but I've heard that you say that you're comfortable with some of these songs that show up on the record, Stay Alive, uh, performing them with Against Me at some point. Is that fair to say? Yeah, of course. Like I, I kind of see a fluidity between all that stuff, you know, and like a lot of the times those boundaries that are in place really only apply when you're younger and you have like too much ego involved with stuff. Um, I really like songs when they can grow and change and take on new meaning and they don't have to just stay some one fixed thing in time, you know? And if you look at like even the history of Against Me, like, you know, we put out a, a couple of EPs that were like these really stripped down, like, um, you know, acoustic guitar and bucket type recordings. And then eventually like we'd re-record those songs in more expanded like full band settings or we've done like the flip even with other stuff um, over the years. But there's no reason to put limitations on anything. And, and really like it comes a lot from where the songs come from of just like, I consider myself a songwriter. I strive to always be writing songs. When I sit down here at my table in my apartment, I'm not like, this will be an against me song. That's ha what it has to be. And then I start writing, you know, it's just like, write a song. And then, well, what's coming up? You know, like, where does this song make sense? If I show it to the band and the band really gels on it and it sounds really good, let's go with that. You know, like if it's not working with the band, maybe I'll do it this way. Um, and, and and there's no reason why it has to be any kind of set fixed thing, you know? Yeah, and that open door is very uh, interesting to think about too, especially as you recall that um, some of this, uh, to borrow some more words from a review, like the folk punk bravado of the early EP is coming back into um, this new record, again, Stay Alive. Um, and the opportunity that you have to take it back into against me and kind of rework it in a new way where you are right now, I think that's really cool. And uh, we'd be looking forward to it if it does come to be. Uh, until then, Supernatural Possession is the single that we're spinning here on CD929 on our new music discovery. Check out the new record, Stay Alive. One last thing before we cut you loose. I always like to run everybody through a quick lightning round here at the end, some rapid fire questions. Cool. All right, cool. Question number one, dogs or cats? Dogs. Coffee or tea? Coffee. What is the prettiest American state in terms of its geographical outline alone? Geographical outline? Wow. What state has the best shape? What state has the best shape? I'm gonna have to go with um, with New York State. A lot of people go with New York State. It's It's got a lot going on. It's not Long just Island. a rectangle, you know? You can't choose it. All the rectangle states are out. <laughs> yeah, I, I made my own like definitive list and the bottom like 30 are just rectangles. <laughs> what is your favorite chord? Do you have a favorite chord? Uh, well, I, I think it's C. The key of C is where I feel most comfortable singing. So uh, I owe a lot to the, to, to the C chord. That's a pirate's favorite chord as well, C. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, one final question though, before we cut you loose that I like to ask everybody that comes through. It's the classic question. Would you rather fight if you had to, one horse-sized duck or a hundred duck-sized horses? A <laughs> hundred duck-sized horses. <laughs> That is the wise choice, for sure. All right, well, we hope to see you back. Thank you again, Laura Jane Grace, for swinging by virtually. I must mention you played on this stage six years ago in 2014. It looked nothing like this. It's been entirely revamped, but those recordings that we have come up like every other week on my show, and I'm always happy to play them. So yeah. can't wait to see it in person down the line when it's safe, see it back here in Columbus. Looking forward to that day. Please tell everyone hello for me. Oh, absolutely will do. Thank you again for your time. Yeah, my pleasure.